Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Bulls on Parade Talk. I am your host, Joshua Sines, and today uh, I thought I'd give you guys a little topic that uh, is really gets on my nerves sometimes, especially when it comes to a lot of people that are really close-minded. And that is, as you can see in the description of the, on the video, need versus talent. Now, I need to point something out to start. Um, a fellow subscriber, Mr. Chad O'Dell, shout out to Mr. Chad O'Dell, who, subscri who is a subscriber to this channel and a follower, has followed me for a while, and I thank you so much for your support, Chad, if you're listening. Um, he posted something on a Houston Texans um, Facebook group page that I would like you guys that are watching this video to see. And for those of you that are listening on the podcast, I will read it to you guys. So... To those of you that are watching, here is the snapshot of the comment on the Facebook page, on the group page, that I want you guys to see. And uh, I'll read it to you guys, just so you can, just so you can see. It, it says, the, the post says, quote, If you want Manziel, then you might as well keep Keenum and use the pick on Clowney. What has Manziel won for his team besides the bowl? Not national and not SEC. He threw a lot of balls up for grabs, too. Heisman. Heisman winners don't have a good rep in the NFL. Dot, dot, dot. That's just my opinion, though. A fan, not an expert. Okay. And Mr. Odell replied just three, three comments afterwards and says, quote, just an FYI, Texans made mistake of need over talent with a Moby. Three of next four picks were Willis, Lynch, and Rebus. So, you guys know me. To those of you that do know me, I um, I really don't know that much. You know, I am a student of this game. There's one thing about me: I was never a football fan my whole life. I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't always like it. I didn't always know what it was about. Um, I was a late bloomer. You know, I became a major college football fan when I got to college. And then I didn't become a pro fan until maybe like 2009 or so. And I really started watching the NFL and really studying the game, the NFL, and really learning more about football in that context. So I, I'm still learning about certain things. So that's why I, um, I join all these groups. I ask, um, I go into these posts and I really, and I do this, um, Another reason I do this is so I can learn myself. You know, this is the kind of stuff that has really interested me um, these last couple years. And, uh, it's, and I'm really having a lot of fun learning all these things that I just completely was oblivious to when I was little, you know. So um, I look at this. So anyway, I look at this guy, Amobi, and I'm like, wait a minute, who is this? So, knowing me, for those of you that know me as well, I'm a big researcher. You know, if there's something out there that I just don't know, I will go out there and I will chase it. I will research it. And so I did. And that brings me to the guy that I want to talk to you guys about going back in history. Now, 2007 draft, it was, it was um, just a little bit of history for me. 2007 um, offseason, I was graduating from high school and I was entering the University of Houston and uh, and so that's basically where I was and back then you know I was just entering college so I had no idea what was going on anywhere so I look at this so I'm looking at this guy you know and I and I really and I pay a lot of attention to the comment that was posted um, on the page and it said need over talent which is why i decided to title this video need versus this episode need versus talent and there's a reason after i did a lot of research on this you know i spent i stayed up until maybe three o'clock three o'clock in the morning the other night looking at all this you know because i had no idea who this was i didn't know a lot about what the texans needed at the time much but then so i went back and i did some history work so I did, and I came across this man by the name of Amobi Okoye. 
But before I get to him, let me get let me give you guys a little a little background on the 2007 NFL Draft. And for those of you that know more about this, that were there at the time, um, feel free to tell me in the comment section about that draft. But this is what I grabbed. But this is the this is the information that I got from a couple sources um, about this draft. So um, at the time, there was a lot of reports about the Houston Texans. You know. Um, we had just come off, I believe, a six and ten season, if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, um, and according to what I've been reading by a couple of uh, scouting reports, you know the Texans really needed wide receivers and a defensive line, you know, because um, we had Andre Johnson, but you know um, there was, but you know David Carr, his time in Houston was just about over, and I'll get to that in a bit, but anyway. Um, you look at this draft, you know, and this was a very rich, this 2007 draft class, and it was very rich in, rich in wide receiver talent, you know, um, and the Houston Texans had the 10th overall pick at the time, and uh, so, but I, I look at the list of wide receivers that were in this draft, you know, I'm looking at guys like, I'm reading down here, it says, there was... Calvin Johnson, Ted Ginn Jr., Dwayne Bow, Robert Meacham. All first-round picks. Just an FYI. You know, at the time, there was a lot of talk about the Texans needing help at wide receiver and defensive line. And so the, 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 the thought process going into the draft was um, a lot of these wide receivers are either going to be taken... These top-notch wide receivers are either going to be taken, you know, higher than the 10th pick or lower than the 10th pick. And the thought process was um, a guy like Calvin Johnson was not going to be there. And lo and behold, he wasn't. Lo and behold, he wasn't. So the Texans, I, the thought going into this drive where the Texans were, were going to go defensive with that 10th pick. And consider this 10th pick almost a very um, a crucial one because... This is the big part because um, the Texans did not have a second round pick in that draft. Why? It's not debatable. You can go look at the. You can go look at the. You can go look at what happened in that in that off season. There was there was no second round pick because of one guy that I'm sure some of you are going to cringe when you hear this guy's name, Matt Schaub. You remember him, Matt Schaub who was a backup in Atlanta his first, in his earlier years, was traded to Houston for the for two second-round picks, the one in 2007, the one in 2008. And also, Atlanta and Houston swapped their first their first round picks. You know, Atlanta at the time had the had the had the um, between the eighth and the tenth pick. Houston had the eighth pick, but they straight but they swapped with Atlanta. So that's how Houston went up from eight to ten. You know, so um, so that's how Houston ended up with a tenth pick at the time, with with Matt Schaub. And you know, at the time, you know, David Carr was not getting any better. And of course, that offensive line needed some help too. But anyway, um, there was a lot of talk in saying that Matt Schaub was going to bring optimism to the passing game. And you know, early in his years, it it did um, help to help Houston get to an eight and eight season. But anyway. Um, so anyway, going into this draft, the thought, the thought based on the need, based on the class seen here was we were going to go defensive, defensive line, defense or safety, or one of these, one of these potential positions. Well, that brings me to the guy that Houston decided to take with that 10th pick. And that is this 19-year-old kid by the name of Amobi Okoye. Now, some of you don't remember. Some of you might not remember him, but shout out to Chad Odell for doing so. Appreciate appreciate the insight on this. Because I looked at this kid, you know, um, born and raised in Nigeria. Football was completely new to this kid. You know, he reminds me a little, when I read his story, he kind of reminds me a little bit of Ezekiel Ansa, you know. Coming from a different country, still adjusting to the game of football, um, was really raw skill wise. But I look at his scouting report. I'm looking at all these scouting reports, especially the one from CBSSports.com, 
And, you know, he had a lot of potential, especially considering um, who he played with. And I'll get to that in a bit. But, you know, I looked at his measurables, you know, coming out of the University of Louisville, back when the Big East was still the Big East. Um, defensive tackle, measured at 6'10", 302 pounds, but his weight really fluctuated quite a bit. He went, like I think, like 297 to 310 Ultimately measured, I think, at around like 302 pounds or so. And at Louisville, you know, he had um, he had um, one okay season. Then he had, then his fine, then his last season, he had he like went off. And I'll get to that. But you know, he played alongside a guy by the name of, by the name of Elvis Dumerville. You remember Elvis Dumerville? Exactly, Elvis Dumerville. And just to go on a little a little bit of a tangent about Elvis Dumerville. This is basically what this guy was working with. Elvis Dumerville. Um, he played at Louisville 2002 to 2005. Of course, Bobby Petrino was the head coach at the time. Um, but, you know, in early, in his, early in his years, he wasn't... Um, he was okay. He was decent. Wasn't really blowing anybody's mind away until... But I. this is the season that I want you guys to pay attention to because this was the season that... Um, that this kid, Amobi, you know, was learning under him. Was was really taking the time to really um, to look at. Because in 2005, this was Amobi's junior year. And this was Elvis Dumerville's fin his, his final year at Louisville. In Elvis Dumerville's final year, 2005, this is 2005 stats only, in college... He racked up 36 solo tackles, 27 assisted, uh, 22 tackles for loss, 20 sacks, 1 interception, 5 passes defended, and 10 forced fumbles. Those were his stats in, at Louisville. In, his one year, in one year, his final year in college. Just something, to, just something to keep in mind. And also... And with all those numbers, this guy was awarded, was given the Big East Defensive Player of the Year Award, was uh, ranked 10th in the Heisman voting, um, was the Nagurski Award winner, which basically is means uh, Most Outstanding Defensive Player, um, Ted Hendricks Award, which is basically Defensive End of the Year, um, and he was... You know, people thought he, you know, in his final year he came out, and people thought that he he and he was gonna go in, and he was gonna go enter the draft. Well, um, the biggest knock on Elvis Dumerville was his size. You know, looking at his size, um, he measured coming out of college 5'11", 258. You know, he had all the talent in the world, but the Denver Broncos took. Elvis Dumerville in the fourth round, 126th overall. And in his first season, though he didn't start any of the any of the 13 games that he played in, he showed or at an early impact despite being undersized that he can come into the come come in, come into the league and make an impact. If not a big one, but at least some impact. And now you see the kind of and now you see what Elvis Dumerville has been doing as of late. Now he's in Baltimore due to some crazy tax issue with Denver, and I, I don't need—I'm not going to go into that. Um, but anyway, that's who Amobi was playing with at the time. You know, in his first season, you know, in his junior year at Louisville, um, Amobi, Elvis Dumerville was drawing a lot of attention because of because of the kind of the kind of production that he was given you know in uh Amobi's jun junior year he only racked 11 solo tackles um 12 assisted four tackles for loss half a sack and that's it that's pretty much that, that those were his numbers um his junior year now, but his senior year when it was basically him on the line you know he had he had one of the best. He had a very good year. One, and people are saying one of the best. For uh, I'm sorry. You know, um, his numbers I'm seeing in 13 games. He played 13 games. 39 solo tackles, 15 assisted, 12 and a half tackles for loss, 
eight sacks, one pass defended, two forced fumbles. That was his senior year. Now consider this. His senior year, he was 18 years old. He was drafted. He was the youngest player to ever be drafted, and I'll get to that in a bit. He was 19 years old, 18 to 19 years old when he was doing this. He was a senior in college. He was still young, still raw, still, you know, learning about the game. Had a lot of potential, though, according to what people were saying about him at the time. Um, so I look at this kid, and, you know, entering the draft process, I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I'm looking at these scouting reports, and I'm saying to myself, whoa, people were really high on this kid. There was a lot of excitement about this kid, potentially about his upside. Now, notice the word, upside, you know? Um, but just like El just like his teammate before him, Elvis Dumerville, the biggest knock on him was his size, you know. Um, and he was he was he was taller than Elvis. He was physically six two, around 300, 300 pounds, and that's still considered undersized, you know. But you look at the comparisons that people give him to. This is CBSSports.com, ladies and gentlemen. People were comparing this kid, this young, very talented kid, to a guy that I'm sure a lot of you know, Reggie White. Now, when I have to be honest, the minute I saw that, the minute I saw that name in terms of comparing him to a player, I'm like, what? Reggie White? Wow. They must really like this kid. This guy must have been really good. So I did what I normally do, and I did more research. I look. I went back and I looked for his um, combine numbers. Went to look for his um, pro day results, his measurables, and all that stuff. So I looked at this guy, and you know, I look at his um, combine results right here in front of me. They said um, he was invited to the combine. Um, let's see, his forty yard. He made, he rounded around about a five, five forty. Um, his vertical, he had a thirty inch vertical, broad jump of about nine feet three inches. Um, he timed when doing the three cone drill. He timed around a seven four six. Um, and then he had then he had two workouts after that on March fourteenth, two thousand seven. And March 26th, 2007. And uh, he timed a faster 40, 488. Um, his, uh, and that was the only thing that I saw here that was really, that really changed in his pro day. Everything else he either didn't do or was pretty much around the same. So nothing surprised me there. But so, you know, around a 48 guy, 5, 48 guy, maybe a 5 type. Speed like guy. So I looked. So those are those are the kind of things that um, he measured at the combine. So I go and look at this guy's um, scouting numbers. So his, his scouting, his his evaluation. Excuse me, not numbers. Evaluation. And you know there were three strengths that people were really telling, saying about him. He was explosive. A very intense, 100% effort, almost 150% effort. Great techniques and moves. Um, and, you know, of course, um, people were saying his he needs to improve his disengaging. He needs to improve disengaging skills and size. Of course, he was undersized. Um, I'm reading a quote here from Louisville Scouting website, and it says here, um, developing player with great upside um, has taken off past two years. He had a great senior bowl, according to what I'm seeing here. Um, he has potential to be a two-gap end or a three-technique lineman. Um, he needs to adjust to the level of competition, of course. Be, of course, being a kid still. I mean, he's about as he's about as old as some freshmen and sophomores. 
in college when he was a senior. You know, um, very instinctual, quick off the snap, good pad level, um, makes plays laterally effectively, uses hands very well. Like I said, it goes back to his technique. Um, he needs, he's slow getting off blocks, which is what they were saying about disengaging. He's slow getting off blocks and can be handled at the point of attack. You know, he's not the strongest guy. Uh, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a lot of top playing strength, which is what you need. Not only do you need speed, but you also need strength to be able to handle the kind of, um, the kind of handle that these offensive linemen in the, in the lead, in the NFL give you. You know, because they will push, if they are stronger than you, they will push you back. And trust me, an offensive lineman's favorite play is to be able to push a defensive lineman backwards. You know, it's it's a way of imposing your will, their will on you. So, um, I go back and look at, at um, what CBS Sports said about him. They said, a great fire, plays with relentless pace. So, again, goes back to his intensity and effort. Uh, speed and explosion. There's that word again, explosion. Needed to shoot gaps. Um, he has and he, and he has quick enough quickness to to be placed at defensive end. So all that all that fun stuff. So all they were saying that he had great upside. Very talented, still young, still learning, has a lot of potential, great upside. Now that's the word upside. And, you know, when looking at the people were saying he was um, the one of the, one of the most talented players in this draft. You know, they had him, I think, here in terms of ranking defensive tackles, he was ranked second. He was ranked either the either the top or the set, either the best or the second best player in this draft class. Right? So what what am I trying to tell you guys here? It's very simple. It's, it's very simple. What happened when the, when the Texans took him? The Texans took him 10th overall in that in that in that draft. What happened? Well, first of all, let me tell you what happened right after the right after the commissioner made the pick. Fan base was very excited based on what I'm seeing here. You know, I went to um, the Chronicles website, and you know there was an article there written by Stephanie Stradley, where the quote was, where the t article is titled "The Open-Minded Fan's Guide to the NFL Draft." To those of you that really want to see this, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it to those people that really like to think outside the box and are not just fixated on one guy. And I'll get to that in a bit. But you know, according to this article, there was a lot of there was a lot of happiness, a lot of happiness on the fan base because they were no. I'm sure y'all remember the 2006 draft when everyone, in a shocking move, took Mario Williams, right? And everyone and the Texans got got criticized heavily for it at the time. But of course, we all saw what happened. You know. Basically, the expectation, there was a lot of hype surrounding this this kid. And he still had a lot of work to do. There was a lot of hype around this kid. You know, a lot of people were considering this guy a steal. You know, not a lot of people were looking at him. He was considered a steal. Out of two years. Out of only two years. And he's only nine, and he was only 19 years old when he was drafted. You know, I don't know. It's just one of these things that just makes you say, only two years. His first year was okay. His second year, after his teammate Elvis Dumerville left, he kind of took off somewhat. Showed great technique. Showed a lot of upside, a lot of potential. You know. And that brings me back again to, and of course, you know, so anyway, before I move on, what happened when he was in Houston? Four years. He spent four 
years with the Houston Texans. 11 sacks total. Wasn't really that good. It wasn't really that productive. Not even compared to Mario Williams. Nothing like Mario Williams when he came out of college. Mario Williams had, I think, 13 sacks in one, in one year. This guy had 11 sacks in four. Just something to think about. Just something to, just something to potentially jog your memory if some of you don't remember this. I certainly didn't. But when I looked at this, I'm like, wait a minute. Why are these people jumping on, the, on some bandwagons now? You haven't even seen the combine. You haven't even seen them play, play NFL football. Especially these guys that are raw. And that's what I'm getting to. You know, I looked through this article on the chronic, in the Chronicle and it said, you know, there's a quote here in this article I just love. I just absolutely love. And it's this. It says, it says here, <clears throat> it's very difficult not to be blinded by blatant need. And I love the adjective that was used. Blatant need. Especially considering, especially considering, you know, there's this need, the hype around this guy. Oh, we need a quarterback. There's this hype around a quarterback. We should get him. Right? When, you know, this is one of these things, excuse me. I just, this is one of these things really gets under my skin sometimes. You know, a lot of these players that are super hyped are basically on, on, on TV all the time. Right? But just something to remember. And and this is something that uh, a lot of the that this article points out very accurately, I might add. And that is small school guys. There are guys that come from non-football powerhouse schools and conferences that really turn out greater than a lot of people have said. And I can give you a couple examples: Matt Ryan, Boston College; Joe Flacco, University of Delaware. Um, Tony Romo, Eastern Illinois. And coincidentally, we have a prospect who's graded as a second round guy from Eastern Illinois. You all know by the name of Jimmy Garoppolo. And I've, and I've studied him and he's got a lot of potential. Um, Andy Dalton, Texas Christian University. Um, Colin Kaepernick, University of Nevada. Um, Drew Brees. Ohio State, Michigan didn't want him. He went to Purdue. Uh, Jake Cutler, Alabama didn't want him. Went to Vanderbilt University, and he had similar buzz. And he had, although from and uh, Ben Roethlisberger, Miami of Ohio, not University of Miami, Miami of Ohio. Um, Eli Manning went to Ole Miss. His father's alma mater. Although from an SC, although from a football powerhouse conference, you know, not a very, not a football powerhouse school, you know, and they didn't win big games in their time, you know. Um, I mean, it's not like. I mean, there are a lot of an Aaron. Ro oh my goodness, Aaron Rodgers. He went to a junior college before he went to the University of California. You know, Alex Smith, Utah. Just, and he was raised in a, almost like a read option offense. You remember that? So this whole thing, there's just all of these guys in the league today. And all, one other thing, Brett Favre, overlooked by the SEC, went to Southern Miss. You know, and now who for a while in the previous future that I've in the previous history that I've seen them play is a conference was a conference USA school. So this whole thing this whole thing about these players from top schools, you know, a lot of these these powerhouse schools don't produce franchise quarterbacks, you know, Alabama, Texas, um 
My University of Miami. No disrespect to any of these schools, but, you know, I have not seen a franchise quarterback coming out of these schools. USC. You know, what happened to the last few USC quarterbacks that have come out? You know, um, Carson Palmer, Matt Liner, Mark Sanchez, Matt Barkley. What's happened to these guys? You know, Matt Liner at the time with Vince Young were considered the best, best talented guys in the league. What happened to those two? Exactly. Nothing. They're now looking for work. Looking for a, looking looking for a place to work. I swear this is why a lot of these top prospects, you know, specifically guys like speak quarterback wise. Quarterback wise specifically need to be looked at you need to be looked at with a grain of salt. They really do. All these guys that are super hyped really need to be looked at with some skepticism. You know, that that's why I always that's why I say Teddy Bridgewater is the best. The best in the class. Most polished, most accurate, the smartest, most hum, most humble. I mean, if you've read his story, I'm sure y'all would agree with me too. I think he's going to surprise a lot of people when he gets into the league. You know, a lot of people were saying that he was going to be the top pick in this draft. Now everyone's talking about um, Jadavion Clowney, Johnny Manziel, Blake Bortles. No matter who takes him, I have a gut feeling. I have a gut feeling that he is going to surprise a lot of people. If there's one guy, you know, everyone was talking about, oh, Johnny Manziel is saying the Texans are going to make the worst decision they've ever made if they don't draft me. Well, you know what? I say the same thing about Teddy Bridgewater. And he's not going to come out and say something. He's not going to come out and say something that arrogant to some people. Some call it arrogance, some call it confidence. Whatever you want to call it, Teddy's not going to do that. But he does have a chip on his shoulder, believe me. Teddy Bridgewater has been fighting his whole life to show everyone that, hey, I belong here. I belong in this league. I belong. I deserve to be the top pick in this draft. You know, part, if it was part, it was if it was me, I'm I'm on I'm on record saying this. If Jadavion Clowney was not in this draft class, I take Teddy top first overall that's me that is me you know guys like Blake um Johnny those two should be looked at with a bit of skepticism especially Johnny you know Blake he has shown that he can he, his skill set his tape has shown that he can be a solid NFL quarterback now he's still a little raw in terms of footwork, and I've I've gone I've gone into details about that in a previous video. You can go check that out on my channel. But you know, people are hyping Blake Bortles too. Especially since his girl especially since everyone found out who his girlfriend was. But that's another issue. You know, Johnny Manziel's been hyping himself since probably since before he started. You remember before he even took a college football snap. He was in trouble. And Kevin Sumlin fought for this kid. And the minute he won the Heisman Trophy, we all saw what happened there. I don't need to go into it. All I'm saying is people are hyping these guys from... Uh, people are, are, are... The media, the fan base are over-hyping these guys when they know absolutely... When they don't have the full facts about these guys. Now that's the thing that really irritates me. And this article and this article on the Chronicle, which I'll leave in the description, really says it accurately. There are all of these fanboys out there. And that's right, I'm calling these people out that are just fixated on this one guy and will not let go of it and won't let go just because they're he's their guy, especially Johnny Manziel. I don't care if you like him or not whoever you are but the fact is this just because you like the guy so much and he's 
they basically they pretty much overhyped this guy and completely ignored the bad side about him. People think, oh, he's absolutely perfect. He deserves to be the first pick of this draft. I don't think so. I personally don't think so, and it's not because I don't like him. I am looking at these quarterbacks fairly. People are saying, oh, I'm just hating on this guy. No, I don't hate this guy. I can't hate these guys. I don't know them. I don't know who they are. But these idiots out there will just go out there and just say all these these facts are facts, but they are incomplete. They're incomplete, they're imperfect, and they don't look at this from an objective standpoint. They don't think about the future. They are, they're thinking about winning now. Well, guess what? The NFL is not a win-now league. The NFL is not college football. College football is about winning now. The NFL is not. I've said that on numerous occasions, and I and I mean it. That is why I get a lot. I, I get so angry at these people, when especially oh my goodness, when people were hyping Tebow. Oh my God, I almost completely lost my temper with a lot of these guys, especially these idiots that have the nerve that, to go on national television and say, oh, he won games. That's what it's all about. Well, guess what? I would not. I there. There is a reason why no one has picked him up yet to be a starting quarterback because he's not. So get over it. I don't care if you like him or not, but if you do like him, be or be a better, be a more rational. Th be. Just, you see what I mean? I just get angry thinking about the, about everything that I had to go through this whole mess. I can just see it happening all over again. No matter what happens to a guy like Johnny and Johnny Manziel, people are saying is the next Tebow based on hype, based on the hype, based on the popularity, based on the hometown hero thing. People are saying Tim T, he's the next Tebow or he's the next Vince Young, right? And I believe that's true because I think when he comes into the league, he's going to sell jerseys. Just like Tebow, Reggie Bush, and Vince Young. All I'm simply saying, all I'm simply saying is it just makes me so mad when there are people just completely dismissing, dismissing some inf information just because they like a guy, just because they really want him to be taken by, his, by their team, whoever they are. And I'm talking specifically Houston Texans, guys, because that's who I'm seeing it from. And I can't stand it. You know, I am not, I do not want to be. <sighs> my apologies, ladies and gentlemen. This is just one of these topics that really gets on my nerves. <sighs> I... I am just not, it's just one of these things that really, really gets me, really gets me, gets on my nerves. Every time I see these guys on social media and Facebook, I am just, I'm just, I just get sick to my stomach. When I'm seeing these people, these, 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 these so-called fanboys completely dismiss the obvious or completely dis look at these things from a from a biased perspective. It really makes me sick. Just because he's hyped so much. My opinion. My opinion just shut up. My opinion just wait until the draft process is over. And then you'll see what happens. For example. The combine is coming up. Let's see what this guy can do. Why isn't Johnny Manziel throwing at the combine? But he's going to do everything else. He's going to run the 40. He's going to run. He's going to jump vertically. He's going to do the long jump. But he won't throw. I don't. I don't know what to make of it. Um, if he's a perfect, if he's a hard worker, good for him. Good for him. I just want to see what these guys do at the combine. At the combine, at their workouts. I really want to see it.
it is one of these things that just really, you know, and speaking of the combine, you know, all these athletes come up and, you know, it's just one of these things that I just really want to see how they do, you know, they hype these guys, but then they show up. But then, you know, it comes to the matter of um, hyping their strengths, completely ignoring their weaknesses. And I can't stand that. But if it's anyone else, oh, they'll, show, they'll, they'll, immediately, they'll, they'll, they'll immediately put their weaknesses on TV or on radio. It really makes me sick. When it comes to these combine, the, the, these workouts, I'm thinking based on the based on their performance based on the based on the times that they give based on their overall performance do they have what it takes to make it in this league that's what i'm looking at do they fit the nfl that's what this that's what these workouts are for to see if they have what it takes skill wise strength wise speed wise you know, endurance-wise, all that stuff. If they have what it takes. You know, um... You know, when you're talking about a guy like Richie Bush, for example. Coming off of a Heisman Trophy winning season. Um, he's an explosive, he's an explosive runner. Um, he's a big school, he's, he came from a big school, but guess what? Coming out of college, he didn't run well between the tackles. He's not a between the tackle kind of guy. He was questionable as an every down back, and we and we've seen that early in his career. And he had thin legs. I don't know about you, but that's kind of a knock on him. You know, um, you look at Mario Williams and D'Amico Ryan's at their combines; their numbers were off the charts. You know, and the kind of measurements that they have pretty much demonstrates the kind of explosiveness that they have. And you look at a guy, and oh my, this is this guy is perfect. You look at J.J. Watt. Oh my goodness. You look at J.J. Watt, a try-hard motor guy. You know, a lot of these guys, they had they had to pay zero attention to his athleticism. But he was the top performer in five out of the six drills at the combine. And, and of course, Andrew Luck. You know, everyone was hyping Andrew Luck. You know, I, I wouldn't say hyping, you know, because he didn't create any of this. It wasn't his fault. But um, people were saying nothing but great things about Andrew Luck. Very smart kid. Playing at a 401 level, can understand defenses so well, has been playing in a pro style system his entire life. Um, and of course, his father, Oliver Luck, played for the Houston Oilers with Earl Campbell as his running back. Um, you know, he had great he had great games in college, not intangibles off the charts. He was a top performer in four out of the five quarterback combine drills. And of course you, and that made him pretty much a consensus top pick. Number one pick, well-deserved. I don't care if he's not RG3 straight line fast. I want, I want a guy like Andrew Luck to, to be taken top overall, over RG3. RG3 was a late bloomer. He was a guy that just shot out of nowhere and said, people were saying before the, before the season started, maybe third round. Has some developing to do. You know, college numbers don't tell everything. College numbers says nothing. College accomplishments mean nothing at the next level. All I'm saying is let's let's just hold hold on for a second here and Let's just hold on a minute here and just wait until these workouts are done. Because I'm very curious. Especially these small school guys that no one talks about. And you can bet I'm going to be paying a close attention 
to the to these prospects moving as as we're approaching as we're approaching the combine and the pro days and and and, 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 and the pro days. So and and you know and and sometimes you have and yeah and you have to keep the one final thing to keep in mind. One final thing to keep in mind. Uh sometimes coaching uh, one fine this this and this is from the article from the Houston Chronicle. Very accurate. Coaching and scheme wise does matter, you know. They look. They come in and look. They they look at these scouting reports. They look at their combine workouts. They look at their numbers and say, "Wait a minute. Do they have the skill set? Are they the kind of player that fits what I want to do?" Right. That's why you're looking at. That's why people are saying. Perfect example is Jadavion Clowney. Um, when they're looking at Jadavion in the Houston Texans, Houston Texans runs runs. Ideally, a three-four defense, but and people are saying Jadavion Clowney is more suited as a four-three end. Well, guess what? Romeo Cornell has been on record saying that we're going to run a multiple front defense, a multiple defense, and you can find that video on my channel as well. Romeo Cornell has said we're going to run multiple fronts based on personnel. And you know there are some guy and another example, and you know. The perfect example in terms of coaching and scheme is quarterbacks. There are some quarterbacks that fit some systems. There are some quarterbacks that are that that, that don't. You know, um, sometimes quarterback needy teams is because they chose the wrong kind of guy for them. They it's it's maybe they didn't have the they, they didn't have pieces around him or they're just not good at developing quarterbacks. And of course Bill O'Brien is a quarterback guy. So I'm really looking forward to whoever he gets. Whoever we decide to get, whether it's the draft or free agency, I don't know. I have no idea. But all I'm saying is with a guy that has worked with the like guys with the likes of Tom Brady, Matt McGloin, Christian Hackleback, I'm very curious to see what Bill O'Brien, how Bill O'Brien develops our quarterbacks. I'm very curious. I'm very excited. I'm very optimistic about all that. And it's, and and coaching especially comes especially important when it comes to like mid late round picks. Just think about it. It's all about opportunity. And you know, part of and another part is just being a guy that uh, can succeed and can compete. And it goes back to what I'm saying about these low round guys that are from small schools or vice versa. They enter the league with a chip on their shoulder. A lot of your greats in this league today they have a chip on their shoulder. Guys like Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, who was taken late draft, by the way. Um, Joe Montana, drafted late. You know, um, Dan Marino, he was from Pittsburgh. Steelers never looked at him. 15 years, made him pay. Um, Roger Staubach, drafted, was drafted so late, the round doesn't exist anymore. Fran Tarkenton was seen as too small. He was dropped in the third round despite prodigious talent. Oh, and by the way, speaking of that, you know, everyone's saying that Russell Wilson opened the door for a small quarterback. I disagree. I like Russell Wilson. But, you know, that door has been open since Fran Tarkin, the little engine that could. I'm just saying... These people that say Russell Wilson's the reason. No, I disagree. It goes all the way back to a guy to guys like Fran Tarkenton. It's I, I'm telling you it's all about hype and revisionist history for, with some people. I just don't get it sometimes. Let's just 
let's just cool our jets here. I am just, I, I'm just saying right here as a final note, before we conclude this episode, I'm, as a final note, I'm just saying, you know, let's, um, let's cool off a minute here and wait for their workouts. Let's see how they do after the workouts. You know, because it's really important. Those matter, despite what some of you some of you might think. Again, my before as before I conclude this this episode, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies for raising my voice, sounding a little a little angry. It's just one of these topics that is really touchy to me, and I I, I hope that you can respect that. So, with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that um, that pretty much wraps things up here on this edition of Bulls on Parade Talk. Uh, if, thank you all so very much for tuning in. Uh, if you enjoyed, please leave a like on this YouTube video. I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, and in the comments section below this video, tell me what you guys think about the need versus talent, about the the concept of need versus talent. I mean, how do you feel about this? Uh, when you're looking at the draft, how do you how do you look at do you do you do you focus mainly on need, or do you look at or do you look at the talent that's in the draft and fair and and, and judge accordingly, and be honest. I would love to hear for what you guys think. I would love to I w- I would love to see a debate in this video about this because this is exactly the kind of thing that's going to be talked about quite a bit. As we head into May, as we head to the draft, um, for more Houston Texans coverage provided by yours truly, go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, I'll be here covering all the latest regarding your Houston Texans all year. Uh, and finally, uh, please be sure to check out my uh, Bulls on Parade Talk podcast on TalkShoe.com. If you haven't already, the full link to that podcast will be in the description below this video. And the link to this uh, YouTube video will be posted on the podcast's episode description for those of you that are listening to the podcast. As always, this is your host, Joshua Signs, signing off.